This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Let's imagine you have friends, and let's imagine you actually want to hang out with them. After a couple of days of trying to decide what to do, you all agree that it might be nice to go out for dinner. The problem is that you can't agree on where to get dinner, so you say that the most fair thing to do is to call a vote. It's quite late, but you know there's a good taco restaurant or some local pizza or burger places. You say that you want a pizza, one of your friends say they want a burger, but then the rest of your friends all say that they want a taco. It seems easy enough to say here that with three votes and a majority that taco wins. Although last night, since you watched a really interesting video about voting, you realise there might be more going on. Because you know your friends quite well, you know that if you ask everyone what their second choice is, they're all going to choose pizza. When you ask everyone about their least favourite, you can see that although three people love taco, you and your other friend absolutely hate them. As a compromise, you point out it might be more fair to get pizzas rather than tacos. As you say this, one of your friends who watched the entire video about voting last night points out that this system is inherently flawed. He says that although he prefers pizza to burgers, it doesn't mean that he likes either of them. He says that in this voting system, it doesn't represent whether he likes one or dislikes one, but rather the order of his preferences. He thinks it's unfair because they already have the majority, so they shouldn't need to look at anything else. Now that we can see some of the issues of voting, let's look at the most common voting system and how we can manipulate its flaws to our advantage. As a basis, we want our voting system to be as fair and practical as possible. The first step towards this is quite obvious. We want the vote to be democratic. To see what I mean, we can bring back a ballot from a voter before, although rather than using the example of food, I'm going to represent the different options with shapes. We can bring back the other ballots adapting them to the new system. It's important to remember that the top row is each voter's top choice, and each subsequent row is their second and then third choice. With that, we can define democratic as valuing each voter evenly, which means we can't just decide based on one person's preferences. It also means that we can't blatantly rig the election so that there's only one choice. Now we can move on to the next feature, which is going to be majority rule. This means that if the majority of people have something as their first choice, then that option will automatically win. This is not a necessary feature, but it leads into the practicality aspect as it's much easier to review the results. The final feature is that it must be single winner, which again is not necessary, but leads into the practicality factor. For example, if we had one person voting for each type of food, it would take a long time to travel between each place, as opposed to just finding a compromise. With the basics defined, let's now look at the most common voting system and how to exploit its flaws. Let's bring back the ballots from earlier and let's add a couple of new ones too. From here, the most intuitive way to decide a winner is to get rid of people's second and third choices and only look at their favourite. This method is called first past the post voting and is used in the United States, Canada and the UK. Deciding a winner using this system is extremely easy since all we need to do is tally up people's top choice, and then the choice with the most number of votes wins. We can clearly see here that triangle has the most number of votes, so then triangle should win. But it's never that easy. Although triangle would be the winner, there are a lot of issues which we can dissect. Firstly, let's group people with the same top choice together, and let's rearrange the page to look like this. The first thing that we can notice is that if we remove square as an option, we would expect the winner not to change. Although with square removed, the final two voters will need to choose something else, now making circle their top choice. With this change, circle now has more votes than triangle, making circle the new winner. If we repeat this, but this time remove circle instead, we can now see that square would win. The main thing across both of these is that triangle doesn't win, which feels weird since removing an option feels like it shouldn't change the winner. And this feature can be used to our advantage. If we separate the circle and the square voters from the triangle voters, we can see that they all have one thing in common. They hate the triangles. Between themselves, they agree that they don't mind each other, but they all don't want triangle to win.
To prevent another triangle win, the circle and square voters can work together. If the square voters voluntarily switch their votes to circle, even without square being removed as an option, then circle will get enough votes to win. Alternatively, the circle voters can also compromise and vote for square instead, also preventing triangle from winning. This idea of changing your vote from your true preferences to a more preferable overall outcome is called strategic voting. We can look further into strategic voting by looking at an extreme case where more candidates significantly skews the outcome. From now on, we're just going to use the bar chart since it's a much more concise way of showing people's top preference. We can vary the votes much more easily using this new system, although I want to look at this particular example. In this vote, we can quite clearly see that triangles have won, although let's change the shapes back into the foods they represented earlier. We can now see with these current results that pizza will have a huge lead over the other two. Let's see what happens if we add another option, for example a spicy pizza. After the new option is added to the polls, they'll gain a decent number of votes as you'd expect. The more interesting feature is where the votes will come from. The people who are the most likely to want the spicy pizza are likely the people that wanted the original pizza in the first place. With the new pizza added, we can see that the votes become split between original and spicy. Now let's add Hawaiian pizza and vegetarian pizzas as an option too. Again, they're going to gain a decent number of votes, but I'm sure you can guess where the votes are going to come from. Original and spicy. The votes get spread so thinly between pizza voters that no single pizza can actually beat taco, which means taco becomes the winner. This is probably single-handedly the biggest issue with elections in the US and the UK. This particular effect, where adding multiple similar options hurts all of them, is called the spoiler effect. There are so many consequences of this one effect, and the most obvious that we've just seen is that if you support Taco, you can use it to skew the election and somehow win. Like we saw earlier, the only way to beat this would be to convince the other pizza groups to switch their votes and vote strategically to prevent Taco from winning. So far, we've looked at the most common issues with voting, although in the next section, we're going to look at the more interesting and clever ways to manipulate a vote. Before we do though, do you know what else is interesting but also easy and free to use? The sponsor of this video, Brilliant. Brilliant is an interactive learning platform that offers you a vast array of courses in science, mathematics, engineering, and more. Whether you're a student looking to breeze through your math exams, or a professional aiming to sharpen your analytical abilities, Brilliant has something for everyone. Brilliant has thousands of lessons, from the fundamentals to the complex real-world applications of the most interesting areas of maths, and is updated with lessons every month. One of the best things about Brilliant is that it doesn't feel like a chore. Each lesson feels fresh and somehow changes the learning into a game. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, consider visiting brilliant.org vix, which also gives you 20% off with the premium annual subscription and is in the pinned comment and the description below. In major elections like those in the UK or the US, we end up having two parties like this. We then ask everyone to choose their favourite option, which we can represent using their candidate. Using the method we had earlier, we would count the votes for red and blue, where we've got six votes for red and nine votes for blue, which means that in this case, blue would win. Though like before, there are a couple of tricks we can use to change this. In a lot of countries, we use a system where we group voters together, usually by location, and then between them, they have to create one larger group vote which we call a representative. In this example, we're going to say that each group has three people and we can make each column into a group. We can see that the first group would have a red representative since every single candidate within this region supports red. In the next group, it's still unanimous with three people voting for red, which means we have another red representative. We can continue to group voters like this until every single voter has a representative. Once we have all the representatives, rather than counting all the raw votes, we're going to count the representatives votes instead. In this particular case, we can see we've got two red representatives and three blue representatives. On the left, we have a pie chart showing how the actual voters felt, 
And on the right, I've put a pie chart showing how the representatives have shown this. In this particular vote, we can see that both charts are the exact same, which is how this system was intended to be used, and we can call this a neutral bias. The issue with this system is that there's rarely no bias. For example, if a red supporter was in charge of designating the boundaries for the representatives, they could intentionally draw them like this. Importantly, none of the voters have changed their location or preference. When we now look at the representatives, all of the red representatives remain the same, although one of the blue representatives has changed to red now. When we look at the pie chart now, even though the actual voters have not changed, when we look at the representatives, we can see we've got a majority for red now, who are actually the minority. This means that by intentionally skewing the boundaries for the representatives, now red has more representatives than blue, and somehow wins the election. We can call this effect minority surge. Finally, if a blue supporter was in charge of drawing the boundaries, they can manipulate the representatives, such that blue has four, making it seem as though they won by a landslide. We can call this effect majority surge. This specific idea is called gerrymandering, and we can see that whether you're a minority or majority, that this system can be abused. The final trick we're going to look at is my favorite, but probably the most complicated as well. We're going to bring back the ballots from earlier, where each column is a voter and each row represents their subsequent choices. The only change I'm going to make is that I'm going to switch the middle person's second and third preferences, which seems like a minor change, but makes a big difference. Like we did at the start of the video, we're going to imagine what happens if we remove an option. We can start by removing circle. By doing this, we can create a table of a one-to-one -one election of triangle against square. In the same way, we can remove triangle and get a table of a one-to-one -one election of square against circle. Finally, we can remove square and get a one-to-one -one election of circle against triangle. After all of that, here is where it all comes together. In the head-to-head -head election of square and triangle, we can see that square has a majority, which means that we can say people prefer square to triangle. For square against circle, we can see that circles have a majority, which means that we can say people prefer circle to square. Finally, for triangles and circles, we can see that triangles have a majority, so we can say that people prefer triangle to circle. Hopefully now, most of you can see the issue. We have a loop of inequalities that never ends. If triangle happens to win, then we know there's a larger majority that prefer something else, in this case square. If square happens to win, the same thing will happen, but this time the winner will shift to circle. This particular idea where there is always a larger, unhappier majority is called a Condorcet cycle. It means that regardless of the winner, the majority of people will be unhappy with the winner. If we look back at the ballot from earlier, where triangle is originally winning, using this idea, we know the square voters can rally together to change the winner. The issue is that we know that this applies to circle as well, which means this can go on forever. But all it really means is that it becomes the ultimate game of rock, paper, scissors. Because a winner needs to be decided, and any candidate can make the same argument, it comes down to which candidate is the most persuasive. Basically, the winner of this game of rock, paper, scissors could become the next president of a country, or decide where to go out for dinner. We've looked at a lot of the flaws in first-past-the-post voting, so I thought I'd end the video by looking at one possible solution. This particular solution is called instant runoff, and solves some of the big issues we saw earlier. Like before, we're going to start with our standard election, where people vote for their favourite option. Once the votes are collected, rather than only looking at the winner, we're actually going to look at the runner-ups too. Starting with the option with the least number of votes, we're going to ask every person who voted for it to say what their second choice would be. Even though they voted for the option with the least number of votes, now their votes won't be wasted. We can repeat this again with the next smallest party, redistributing their votes. We can see that by the second repetition, Taco was already lost, where originally we would have already declared them the winner. Once one party has at least 51% of the votes, they can stop redistributing the votes and declare a winner. The best thing about this system, it allows for more than two viable options to choose from, which leads to more diversity of choice and minimizes the number of people needing to vote strategically.
we can see that first-past-the-post voting does satisfy the original criteria, but does suffer from the spoiler effect, people having to vote tactically, and the fact that it usually leads to only two main parties. Instant runoff does technically have these same issues, although to a significantly lesser effect. They both do still suffer from the Condorcet problem and gerrymandering, but creating a perfect voting system is actually impossible, which is unfortunately something I can't prove in 15 minutes. While first past the post is the most prevalent voting system, you should at least be able to recognise and exploit its flaws, since it's more likely than not that other people are too. Next time you do go out, don't forget that if blackmail and coercion don't work, that you can always just rig the election anyway. Thanks for watching.